Today we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday, the, the day that Jesus was resurrected. Actually, as followers of Christ, we celebrate that every day because it's why we follow Christ. Not only because he died, but because he was resurrected again. And so, there, of course, there's a lot of joy and celebration around that. And I hope you've sensed that today. I hope you participated in that joy and celebration. But, I hate to say but, or I should say however, on that resurrection Sunday, almost 2,000 years ago, there was, there's, a, there's a problem that I want to talk about today, and you think, well, why are you talking about problems on Easter? There's not supposed to be problems. It's supposed to be good stuff, because we're going to show you how it can be good stuff, right? And I want to talk about a one-word problem that, as I was reading the, the resurrection story this week, it kind of surfaced, surfaced up, this one-word problem it could be a cause of many of the issues in your life today. I don't know, maybe it's been a cause of issues in my life in the past. Uh, it was certainly a cause of some issues with the early followers of Jesus. Uh, it could be keeping you from everything that God has for you. You know, God has more for you than just not going to hell and going to heaven, which is awesome. And if that's all, all there were, that would be great. But there's so much more that God has for you. And if, if you struggle with this problem, we're going to talk about one word problem, um, it could keep you from experiencing that. You want to know what that word is? No? Okay. Well, I guess we're dismissed for the day. <laughs> Anybody want to know what it is? Yes. I'm going to tell you in a minute. <laughs> I'll, before I, before I, I give you that word, and, we, and we're going to talk about it, I, I want to read uh, this, these 12 verses uh, from the book of Luke. Now, every, every gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, record from, from their, their viewpoint and through the Holy Spirit, their... What, what, what they observed on Resurrection Sunday. But this is Luke, chapter 24, starting in verse 1. So we're going to, as I read this um, resurrection story, when I get finished, I'm going to give you that one word problem, then we're going to talk about it so that you don't struggle with it, all right? And this one word isn't exactly in here, but the concept is. So let's read it. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, "'Why do you look for the living among the dead?' He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. All right, you ready for that one-word problem? Here it is. Number one in your notes, if you're, if you're keeping track in your notes, the one word problem is unbelief. Unbelief. It's, it's here in the women and in the apostles. So when the angels, what, what struck me as I was reading this is when the angels said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And when they asked that, if the women would have been totally honest, totally honest, they would have said, well, because we really don't believe what Jesus said. 
If they were really honest, that's what they would have said. Like that, that's why we're looking for this dead body, and that's why we brought spices for this dead body, because we really don't believe what Jesus said. Now, they didn't say that, and I don't even know if they really realized that, but that's totally what was going on. Um, how do I know that? Because Jesus told his followers many, many times, almost exactly to the T, and well, certainly to the day, what was going to happen. Now, here's just one place. There's several places in, in the Bible, but here's just one. Luke 18, starting in verse 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. All right, so Jesus said this in the days before his crucifixion, uh, in the weeks before, maybe even months before, and he said it multiple times. So he said exactly what was going to happen. They're going to beat me, whip me, arrest me, beat me, whip me, and then kill me. But I will rise on the third day. Like, how much, how much more literal could you get, right? So he said this many times, but and people said, well, they said, well, they finally remembered that. I don't think it was a memory problem. It was a belief problem. They had heard it several times. So, but when the women finally realized what Jesus said was true, when they finally came into belief, from unbelief, then they run to the apostles and say, he's risen. But then what do the apostles say? We'll go back to Luke 24, verse 11. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. <laughs> Sounds like a man, doesn't it? Oh, you're filled with nonsense, right? <laughs> women, you're supposed to heartily agree with that. Yes. <laughs> but unbelief with the apostles because the apostles had heard the same thing that Jesus said, they're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise on the third day. And even when the ladies came back from the tomb, said the tomb's empty, he's risen. Angels told us that. They're like, we don't believe you. <laughs> but really? It says they didn't believe the, the women. But who did they really not believe? Jesus. Didn't Jesus say, they're going to kill me and I'll rise on the third day? He did say that. Thank you, Tannis. And when, when he did, they were like still not believing that. Um, they weren't believing Jesus. So here's this problem I want to, I guess, just talk about a little bit for a bit here today is how can followers of Jesus fall into unbelief? I mean, these are, these are people that were with Jesus, some of them for three, three and a half years. Some not as long, but they've been with him a long time. And he, and he told them what was going to happen, and he, he shared so much, and, and they're following him, and they gave up so much to follow him. But then they, they fall into unbelief. So as we talk about this, I want, to, I want to talk about belief, faith. All right, when we say belief, um, you could, it's synonymous with faith. Trust, and I, and I should point out in, in some scriptures coming up, the original words of the New Testament, which, which are written in Greek, faith, belief, trust, they're all the, pretty much the same Greek word, just a different form of, of the Greek word. So, with that being said, there's a difference between a saving faith and a living faith. All right, let me say that again. There's a difference between a saving faith and a living faith. We're going to talk about living faith in a minute because that's where we want to get. But let's talk about this saving faith, and this is number two. Saving faith is trusting Jesus to save you from hell and give you eternal life. All right, that's, that's the very most basic faith in Jesus you can have, that he saves you because of your, your sin in your life. Your, you've, we all have been separated from God, and none of us deserve to be in his perfect presence forever. 
But Jesus came to save us from that. We talked about that on, on Friday night at our Good Friday service, the whole, what he did for us on the cross. He came to save us from hell and give us eternal life with him in a perfect place forever. Good news, right? Thank you, Jesus. Now, let me just talk, uh, give, me a, just give you a few verses uh, regarding this saving faith. Very quickly, and you, some of you know these verses very well. John 3, 16. You see it in the end zones of all the football games. It's back last year I saw it. John 3, 16, the guy in the end zone, right? Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. All right, so that, that word, whoever uh, the, um, believes, the Greek word is pistuo, um, which is related to the word, Greek word for faith, which is pistis. So there's pistis, pistio, pisteo, all forms of the same Greek word. That, that's believe, that faith. Whoever has faith in Jesus, whoever trusts in Jesus, it's not talking about just knowing that he exists. The devil knows that. But whoever trusts in him, believes in him, has faith in him, will have eternal life. They'll not perish, which means they're not going to hell, they're going to heaven. Saving faith. Here's another one. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Through faith. You've been saved through faith. That belief, that trust. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by works so no one can boast. Again, there's that word faith. Uh, Greek word pistis. It's the noun version of pistil. If you trust in Jesus and him alone for your eternal life, you're saved. That's how you get saved is simply trust in Jesus. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. That's what I would call, and what would many call, I guess, a saving faith. That faith saves you. Yea, for, for saving faith. But what about living faith? That's where I really want to kind of drill down a little bit more because that's that's the area that so many Christians, so many followers of Christ deal with. And I think that, that was a problem that the followers of Christ uh, that, who were there at his death and resurrection struggled with. They didn't struggle with a saving faith. I don't think they struggled with this living faith. Well, what is living faith? Well, this is my definition, but you, you can take it or leave it. But I think it's biblical. Here it is, number three. Living faith is trusting in the supernatural power of Jesus in every aspect of your life, no matter what your circumstances look like. Now think about it. On that, that Good Friday, well, it wasn't Good Friday to them, the day of Christ's crucifixion, as the followers of Christ looked around, well, most of them didn't even look around because they weren't even there. They weren't even there. Just a few were there. Like, the circumstances said, this is not turning out like we thought it was going to turn out. This is not how it's supposed to turn out. They were disappointed, disillusioned, pro hopeless probably, and <laughs> they weren't trusting in the supernatural power of Jesus. They, they had a, some level of trust, but obviously they didn't believe some of the more crazy things he was saying like, I'm going to be raised from the dead. It's kind of crazy. Like, well, that's too crazy to believe. And now here he is dead, so I guess, he, I guess what he said was not right. So let's talk about this saving, or this living faith. Matthew 17, last part of verse 20. This is Jesus speaking. He says, truly I tell you, if you have faith, all right, that belief that trust, if you have that as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I know you read that like, oh, so we can move mountains. So you can say we can move mountains. Well, I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Now, it's not that we're just like going around moving mountains like, hey, watch this. I'm going to invite my friends over. Watch me move a mountain. That, that's, <laughs> but when, 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 when something needs to be done according to God's will, his power flows in us and through us, and our words have power, and we speak his will into action 
crazy things happen. We've seen it. We've seen it in healing. We've seen it uh, in, in so many ways in, in people's finances, in their health, in relationships. It's just so many, we've just seen it a lot. But it seems, it seems kind of crazy. But that's living faith. It's a faith filled with the supernatural power of God. Your faith in Jesus unleashes that supernatural power. There was a man who had a son that was demon-possessed. The Bible says demon-possessed, but original language it means influenced by the, the devil. So whether it's pos- what we would call possession or not, but a young boy that the devil was after. Um, he had been to the other disciples when Jesus wasn't around and they weren't able to, to get rid of the, the, the demonic oppression that the little boy was under. And so the dad brings, brings him to Jesus. And so we'll pick up the story in Mark chapter 9, verse 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus, kind of in a, I don't know, not a mocking way, but he says, if you can? Like, the guy says, Jesus, if you can do something, he's like, if I can do something? He's like, with Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Do you see that? For the one who believes, believes as opposed to unbelief. For the one who believes, who has faith, who has trust, anything's possible. Now, in the other areas of the, in the context of the Bible, it says according to his will, right? So it's not, not whatever you want. He's not a genie in a bottle, but according to his will, which is he always has your best interest in, at heart, nothing is impossible. So, verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Right there, that dad just put the finger on where most Christians live. Right there. Like, we have, a, we have this saving faith, right? We, we trust Jesus for eternal life. At least believers do that. That's what makes you a believer. That's what makes you a follower of Christ. Going to church does not make you a follower of Christ. Now, followers of Christ should go to church, but what makes a follower of Christ a follower of Christ is belief, trust in him. So (laughs) we have this saving faith, but we struggle with this living faith, like believing God for things that seem a little crazy, to even think could happen because it hasn't happened for so long. Like, my kid has been ravaged by this emotional, mental, even physical torment for years. Nobody's been able to help. If you could do something, Jesus, that'd be nice. I can do something. Just believe, just trust. Really what the the dad was saying, I I believe, but I, I need to believe more. And living faith is often a work in progress, all right? Saving faith is, is it's a moment, right? When you have saving faith, it's, it's kind of a, when I say moment, I mean, it could be a season, I get that, as you come into, all of a sudden, you just wake up someday and like, you know what? I just really trust in Jesus. I just, I just believe him. Now, for some people, that happened in a moment. Some people, it was, maybe they can't point to a moment, but like, I just, all I know is I trust in him. Well, either way, you're saved, right? Saving faith, good. But this living faith, that's, again, more of a work in progress. Problem is, a lot of Christians aren't progressing. I was there for a long time, so I know what I'm talking about. Because I had this, this saving faith, and I thought that's all you need, all there is. I didn't understand this concept of living faith. Actually, probably until I had even pastored for several years, and I was like, you know, Jesus might actually be saying something that's true. <laughs> like, nothing is impossible if you believe, according to his will. As, as I begin, and, and people around me begin to step out in belief, in trust, in faith, speaking uh, according to God's will, we begin to see circumstances change and things change, in the, even in the physical realm. It was amazing. Um, 
But so many Christians get stuck at some level of unbelief. Does that kind of make sense? So, so as we kind of separate this saving, there's no level of saving faith, right? E- either you have it or you don't. You either trust him or you don't. It's, it's black or white, yes or no. Got that? But this living faith, because it's a work in progress, it's like, well, we can have a measure of living faith, but how much of a measure do you have? How much do you want? Well, hopefully, hopefully you want a lot because it makes a difference in your life and in the lives of people around you. So how, how can you move from a saving faith to a living faith? That's a question I would really want to get to, right? Because most of you here probably have a saving faith. Maybe some of you don't, and we can talk about that in a minute. But, but most of you have a saving faith, but have you made that move into a living faith? And is that progressing in your life? Is that growing? Um, And while that could be a whole sermon series in itself, I just have one point this morning, and it's number four. To have a living faith, you need to have a living hope. Hope and faith are two sides of the same coin. Hope and faith are not the same thing, but they're really closely related, all right? They're two different Greek words in the New Testament. They're two different words in the English, but they necessarily go together. Hebrews 11.1 talks about that. Hebrews 11.1 gives us basically a biblical dictionary definition of faith, and here's what it is. Hebrews 11.1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Now, this hope here doesn't mean like worldly hope, like a pipe dream, like, oh, cross your fingers, I don't know. No, it's, it's, it's a, actually, the hope in, in this original language means um, to expect or to anticipate with pleasure. We almost don't want to dare do that anymore, do we? I mean... <laughs> Isn't it hard, harder, maybe, in the world we're living in now that we're surrounded by in our circumstances? It seems harder to anticipate things with pleasure because you're waiting for the hammer to fall, right? I don't want to dare anticipate too much because something's going to come up and muck it up, and I don't want to be disappointed. So let's just lower our expectations. Let's just grind it out, and then there's no disappointment, Right? I mean, I know that's not you, that's other people that you know, but come on, that's, we just put our finger on something, didn't we? It's like, let's lower our expectations so we're not bummed out when it doesn't, when it doesn't happen. Um, hope, to expect, to anticipate with pleasure, and there's a sense of trust in there. So faith, pistis, all right, this belief, this trust uh, is necessary component is hope. There's this expectation, expectation, anticipation with pleasure, and the assurance about what we do not see. So we haven't seen it yet. So faith means I haven't seen it. It hasn't happened, but I'm expecting it, and I know it's going to happen. That's faith. That's living faith. Now it's also saving faith because you haven't seen heaven yet. If you're here, well, unless you got like an early trip and came back, I don't know, maybe some of you did, I don't know. But you've not seen heaven. You've not lived there. I mean, we're citizens of heaven, but we're not living there. Someday you will, but you're trusting, like, okay, I have anticipation with pleasure and expectation about eternity in heaven. We just sang about it earlier today where there's no more pain, no more suffering, and, and we look forward to that. Saving faith. But there's this living faith where we can actually have hope for our life right now in this world we're living in right now. Faith is having the assurance of what we are expecting. The followers of Jesus apparently did not expect him to rise from the dead. That would be fair to say, right? From what we read, they show up Sunday morning spices on his, sorry to say, rotting body, 
and there's no rotting corpse there. It's empty. He's risen. So they, they weren't expecting that. They weren't anticipating with pleasure. Why? Because of their unbelief. Now, they had a saving faith, but did they have a living faith? Apparently not. I said faith or belief and hope are two sides of the same coin. Conversely, hopelessness and unbelief are also two sides of the same coin. It's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? What comes first, unbelief or hopelessness? And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes we, because we don't believe, we don't expect, then we lose hope. And sometimes because we've lost hope, because things don't look like we thought, think they should look like, then we maybe, it can turn into unbelief. So do you see how it's kind of, again, two sides of the, of the same, same coin? They feed off each other. Hopelessness and unbelief feed off each other. And certainly the followers of Christ that resurrection morning had both of those. They had this disappointment would be an understatement. Probably despair would be a, a better word. And we know they had lost hope because if you keep reading in Luke, we're not going to read it, but if you keep reading in Luke 24... It talks about two disciples, two followers of Christ, who were walking home from Jerusalem on that Sunday, that resurrection day. They'd, they'd been in Jerusalem when he was crucified, and they hung out for a couple days, and finally, on the third day, Sunday, they're just, they're walking home. It's like, pfft. They didn't know that Jesus starts walking with them, the, the risen Jesus. Now, I don't know, and we're not going to, I'm not preaching on this, but I don't know if they just were so in such despair they didn't recognize him. I don't know if he looked different in his resurrected body or if he purposely hid himself from their eyes for a time being, but whatever, they didn't recognize him. And he goes like, hey, you just come start walking with him. What are you boys talking about? He goes, they're like, don't you know? Come on, man. everybody knows what happened in Jerusalem. They killed Jesus. And we had hoped he was the one to deliver Israel. Notice the past tense. We had hoped. If you had hoped, and now you no longer hope, you're hopeless. Right? Maybe not totally devoid of hope, but the hope has been diminished. There's certainly disappointment. Could be despair. The followers of Jesus allowed their disappointment and their despair at the crucifixion to turn into hopelessness. And I believe that fed into their unbelief. There's a worldly hope that people look for. It's like looking for life among the dead. And that's what really struck me as I read this, actually, Luke 24, where the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? I'm thinking, how often do we do that? in our own life, right? We're, we're looking for what the world has to offer in this area of hope or peace or whatever, and it's like it never satisfies. Because devoid of, of Jesus Christ, it's a dead hope, right? And so we look for that. It's like we need to ask that question to ourselves today. Why are we looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking life for anything apart from Jesus Christ? Because you're not going to find it. I mean, you might find a little glimmer, but it's, it's, it's not going to last. There's a worldly hope looking among the dead that's apart from Jesus, and there's a living hope that only comes through Jesus, an expectation that he's going to move on our behalf. Living hope is living with this great expectation of seeing God's supernatural power. Seeing somebody come to life who has been dead for three days, or as Anne Marie would say, two and a half days, um, either way, like that's a supernatural miracle. That's like crazy. It's probably why they didn't believe. 
But that's, that's, that's the living hope we have. And, we, and God demonstrated this supernatural power that lives among us in the person of Christ and that we can expect these things. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You can have that living hope because Jesus is alive. That's how we get it. When you receive him, accept him, Jesus says he lives in you. He told his early followers, he said, I've been among you. He said, but in a little while, he was talking after his death and resurrection, ascension to heaven, he goes, a little while, I'm going to be in you. He's talking about the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is, you know, part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit in you. Colossians 1.27. I love this verse. It says, to, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. Because there's a mystery. And he says, I'm about ready to tell you the secret. Here's the mystery. Here it is. You ready? Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's the mystery. See, that's what the devil didn't see coming. That's what the Old Testament believers really didn't see coming. It's like, Christ in you? The Holy Spirit, like, in you? That's kind of crazy. How can there, I, I'm my own spirit. How can I have a spirit in me? Well, if you're a believer, you have a, another spirit in you. It's the spirit of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. He's the living hope. All made possible by the resurrection of, death and resurrection of Jesus. Living hope is not a philosophy. It's the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit living in you. Oh, unbelief it will not only keep you from experiencing God's supernatural power in your life, it can also cause you to live in disappointment, in despair, even hopelessness, at least diminished hope. That's what unbelief does. And if you're looking for hope among this fallen world um, and what it has to offer, you're, you're going to be let down and you're going to be disappointed. It's not going to deliver what you need. It's not going to deliver what you want, looking for life among what's dead. But if you move, if you will move from a saving faith to a living faith, you'll find peace for your soul. Real peace, the shalom of Jesus. You'll find that in living, in living faith and living hope. You'll find joy, real joy in your heart. And listen to this. You'll begin to anticipate life with pleasure. Oh, man. Do we dare, do we dare even dream that? I mean, do we, like, do we dare dream that? Do we, do we dare expect that? We could actually anticipate life with pleasure. God wants you to. He wants you to anticipate life with, with this pleasure idea of pleasure, this expectation, but it, for that to happen, you have to have a living hope, Christ in you, and this belief that he's going to move supernaturally in you and through you. So a question this morning, first I need to ask, do you, do you have a saving faith? That's where it starts. You need to have a saving faith. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? I'm not asking, do you go to church? I'm not asking if you read your Bible. I'm not asking if you do good works. Those are all good things and you should do those. They don't save you. What saves you? Trusting in Jesus. That saves you. So the question is, have you made a decision to trust Jesus? Because it's really a decision. If you're here this morning, you've not made that decision, I encourage you with everything in my being to make that decision, to put your faith and trust in him. The moment you do that, the moment you do that, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and all of a sudden, things 
are different. Maybe not right away, maybe for some people they are, and I've seen that, but, but all of a sudden you begin to have different thoughts, different attitudes, the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding you. Now maybe you're here this morning and you have saving faith. Maybe you've had it for a long time, maybe decades. Do you have a living faith? Have you moved from saving faith to living faith? Because that's really the point of today's message <laughs> is moving like the disciples had to move eventually after those re days of the resurrection when they could finally believe Jesus. Okay, now we have this saving faith. Now they moved into a life of miracles. And we're going to be talking about that as part of our Bible engagement project over the next several Sundays. And we don't want you to miss that. It's exciting to see to see what a living faith will do in a bunch of fishermen and women who nobody believed. Amazing stuff. We want you to move from saving faith to living faith. We want you to also be filled with the living hope of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit, it's Christ in you. That's that living hope. So as we close today, if you're physically able and would be willing to stand up, as we close this morning, I'm gonna invite our prayer time people up. As we close, actually singing about this biblical concept of a living hope, um, if you have circumstances in your life, situations in your life, maybe it's health issues, maybe it's relational issues, maybe it's financial issues, emotional issues, mental health issues, whatever it is, and you need some hope, and you need, you need some expectation that God's going to move on your behalf. I invite you to come up as we continue in worship. And, and these folks up front would love to pray with you. They pray confidentially. They don't share things. And they pray confidently. And when we, when we speak God's will, things happen. And they're going to they're speak God's will into your life and the lives of those around you and and when they ask the holy spirit to fill you with hope and this living hope and this living faith he's going to do it because when you come in faith and ask god gives so if you if you like i like a little more of that then come on up for prayer as we close in worship today but let me pray first lord first of all jesus thank you thank you so much for coming to this earth dying a painful death on the cross. But Lord, thank you for your resurrection. Father God, thank you for resurrecting Jesus. Your power to bring life out of death so that we no longer have to look for life among the dead. We can look for, we find life among the living, which is you. So Lord, for all of us here, I pray we have a living faith and a living hope that only comes from you in us. So fill us now, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.